All right, today on the show we have Mike Leonard, uh, singer, songwriter, guitarist, extraordinaire. Uh, played in a band called Bleeding Hearts as well as a m plethora of other projects. But today we're going to focus on Bleeding Hearts. Bleeding Hearts was Bob Stenton from um, The Replacements' last band before he passed. And it's been shelved for like 30 years. And now it's out. It's out now. The Replacements were one of those genre-defying bands, right? And Bob's guitar playing was a huge part of that. You can hear the Pixies' influences clearly in, in, the, in the Replacements. And uh, this record is a part of his history that's been hidden forever. And now, now it's out. We're going to listen to a track. This is Rich's Rag. <laughs> Rich's the Rags, the Bleeding Hearts. Right? Rockin'. It's, it's, this record's insane. It's one. It's incredible how they didn't... We talked to Mike about it, but they didn't do anything to the record other than mix it for digital formatting. Like, that's how they tracked it, man. It's a tight record. It's this missing link to this uh, replacement story in a way. So this was a really cool conversation. I'm really excited to share it with you guys. If you can like, rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on one of the podcast platforms, it helps me keep talking to cool guests like Mike and sharing his insights with you. So without further ado, here's Mike. With that, to jump into it, I wanted to kind of set the scene a little bit. And uh, can you kind of explain like uh, uh, the importance of like Orfolk records? Um... Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's pre pretty well documented in a lot of the Minneapolis punk music history, and and you know, it, I think uh, Bob Mayer talks about it a lot in, in his book uh, Trouble Boys. But um, it actually, sadly, kind of just closed uh, yeah. in the last in the last two years. But um, yeah, just a really cool record store um, that that. Uh, People kind of just, it was kind of like a, a seamster hangout. And, uh, I mean, before, before my time, that's kind of where, um, you know, I, I believe Paul Westerberg met Peter Jesperson, um, and kind of got the wheels rolling for the replacements, I think. Um, and, uh, but yeah, um, cool place. They had a basement. I used to go there. Um, and, uh, go through the records in the basement. They had a lot of like bootlegs and stuff on vinyl. Um, so I was <clears throat> at the time I was into like finding old stones, bootlegs and stuff like that. Um, so that's what I would, I would hang out in the basement. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> Was it, um, yeah, I was going to say, I hear they have some, uh, good, uh, Stones bootlegs. I hear, uh, you had to buy some of them twice. <laughs> <laughs> I got the story circulating now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I had, a, I had a friend that, um, worked at another really cool record store, Garage Door Records. Um, and, uh, yeah, I guess Bob, how did that happen? Um, I think Mark Trios from our folks called Mike at garage door and said, Hey, uh, Bob just, Bob just sold me a, a, a stones bootleg. And I know Bob doesn't really like the stones. Uh, and Mike Lahaka was friends with me. He knew that, you know, I was the stones man. And he's like, ah, I feel kind of weird calling you and asking you about this, but, uh, Bob just, uh, sold Mark Trios the stones bootleg. I was like, and and those bootlegs were like fifty bucks. Right. I remember. I, was, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I I actually still ha I still have some of them. And and you know, looking back, it's like, well, now of course, you can just go on YouTube and and probably hear most of them. You know, or um, a lot of them have been um, put out officially. You know, by the Stones, like the better ones. But um, anyway, it's crazy to think that I I spend 50 bucks on that back then but yep <laughs> it's a gamble too you know what i mean with a bootleg because it's either going to be amazing or you're just going to get like the pocket recorded you know what i mean like or <laughs> like pocket recorder <laughs> where it just sounds like trash and you you got to right. commit to like the 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 weird image they found for the cover of it and you're like okay this looks like it's gonna be all right <laughs> yeah 
No, if, if I remember right, they were um, they would actually let they would actually play it for you if you if you oh, ask okay. them. Okay. Nice. Um, so that at least that part of the gamble was was taken out. But yeah, definitely some were some were definitely better than others. What got you into the Stones? Um. Well, let's see. When I I was just telling the story the other day, the uh, my first memory of like being introduced to rock and roll was like i don't know i was like five or six and this the show came on on tv called the roots of rock and roll and uh after that i i, I kind of became obsessed with with elvis and bought a couple elvis records but i remember on that same special though um there was this scene with mick jagger and he says mick jagger says the best rolling stones cause madness Huh. And uh, and then it then it kind of then it still showed like a, a montage of like screaming girls and stuff, and I I turned around and I looked at my dad and my dad says I don't like him, <laughs> <And> I, <laughs> so it was like uh, and I think I think at the time when I was like five or six I I thought it was a little bit scary myself but yeah but yeah that that kind of um, you know the, the parents disapproval kind of poured a little gas on the fire for. Um, making you want to dive into it more. Nice. That will definitely do it. That will seal the deal. Yeah. I don't know about them. You're like, oh, that's pretty cool. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I know every every record I, I bought until, like, I don't know, a certain age had to be vetted. Um, oh, yeah. By my, I, in fact, I remember I, I bought Some Girls when it came out, and um, I don't know if, if you remember, remember or, or know about the inner inside sleeve there's some, like some kind of their liner notes are really are kind of you know crazy liner notes like yeah for like you know the credits for who played what and it says like one i think it says like one jew one wasp one you know it's like kind of really just non-linear weird liner notes that don't make any sense and i was like 10 years old you know and and uh <laughs> I go, I go in to ask my mom, like, what does this mean? And then she the cover, and like, she hadn't, she hadn't noticed it in the record store, but the inside cover part where, or the, you know, where it's the, the women's bra ads, right? And she, and and she took it from me. She took the album cover from me. <laughs> so to this day, I have a copy of Some Girls that only has the uh, inner sleeve. That's amazing. Uh, with no cover. Like, what's a great record though? That was the second Stones record I got. The first one was a Exile on Main Street. I had a guitar teacher who was like, "Yeah, you want to listen to this one?" I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> I'm like, "Holy shit!" <laughs> yeah, yeah. That one wrecked him for me because I'm like, nothing else is really like this record in a way. You know, yeah, Exile. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm. That was weird. That I, that one I came came like a little bit further down the line for me. I think I I I got hot. Wait. Hot Rocks first, okay, and then uh, and then I think Get Your Yeah Yeahs out, which yeah, which is a great one. That the the Mick Taylor stuff is the best, I think. But yeah, for the for the sheer guitar playing, but right, um, right. And then I I found a I found a cassette on the street that had Sticky Fingers on one side and Blind Faith on the other side. Whoa. So that's how. That's how I got sticky fingers. <laughs> <laughs> That's all. That's another instant classic. That's a banger of a record. And the, the B side it with Blind Faith. That's a good combo wombo, especially if you've never heard either of those. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. Um, very cool. So at that time, were you playing guitar? Was music? Was were you writing songs or or like just taking everything in when you're diving into the Stones? Yeah. Um. I think probably shortly after I, I got into the Stones, I, I started um, playing guitar. Um, I kind of I went through a little Elvis phase, and then the Beach Boys, and then Kiss. Then I saw Kit, my first concert and was Kiss on the nice. Dynasty. Yeah, um, and that would have that would have probably put me at about ten, and then uh, and then after that, I think it was like fifth and sixth grade is when I switched over to the stones and um and then probably seventh grade 
sixth, seventh grade, maybe started playing guitar. Um, yeah, I started, I, I wanted to, I mean, I wanted to play electric guitar, of course. And, uh, um, my mom took me to this, this Schmidt music by my house and, uh, and they recommended I started on acoustic and I was like, ah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> so i'm in these so i took these like acoustic group like lesson oh, you're like those, yeah sitting there strumming like scarborough fair and <laughs> kenny rogers the gambler and stuff right. like that like oh, i want to learn stones <laughs> those are those lessons one uh, uh are the worst to teach and two are the worst to be learning <laughs> like like um it's, it, unless you're like the advanced student who already knows all the chords, you're like, oh, what, I hold on here, yeah, and I gotta move it here, yep, right now. When, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, it was like a lot of it was, um, you know, getting the whole class to learn how to do like thumb, do like one thumb and then like a strum and then you know yeah. like a root fifth, you know, like rudimentary like acoustic guitar picking and uh you know i mean it's all all good things to learn but it was keeping me from the good stuff right <laughs> right i mean all those rudiments do eventually when you dive into the good stuff you're like oh shit they're doing that too like <laughs> now i gotta catch up on that you know what i mean like um right but it, it i feel like i don't know teach you gotta have that spark you gotta have that spark right away but it, clearly, you found it on any way. You know, even going through the boring lessons, you know, and getting to the getting to the stones. Did you just like? Were you just after that, like, kind of just picking it at ear, trying to like figure out how these records work? And if was there like one particular song that kind of unlocked the guitar for you? Um. Yeah. Actually, what as it happened, um, like I had been tr trying to, you know, figure out how to play lead guitar for a while you know and i i knew that you know like the pentatonic scale and it just didn't sound you know it doesn't sound very musical at first when you're going up and down um the pentatonic scale and you, right. and you just kind of don't get it you know yeah uh, and then um uh, I, I was uh i had i was playing along to black market clash and uh nice. and and what song was it um I forget what song it was. Now it's something on side one, but I I started kind of playing by ear along to that solo and that that kind of that sort of unlocked it, I guess. You know. Okay, that makes sense. Like, there's a point where it's like, well, these are words, and then you put them in a sentence. You know, like it, just the words by themselves are pretty nonsensical, and running scales is so unmusical, but it's kind of the most musical thing ever. You know what I mean? Like, those are, like, the, the key ingredients to, like, making your own phrases and stuff. And it's just, it's really interesting what what unlocks that kind of speech pattern for a player. Uh, right. You know? So, but Black Marker Clash, that's a great record, man. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think. Was it that reggae tune on the front? What, I'm trying to think which one had a guitar solo. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> would, it, would it have been... Um... Uh, the Prison. bank robber. <laughs> well, that's side two. Um, that's side two. Okay. It might have been like the uh, the prisoner. Okay. Or um, jail guitar doors was or, that on or, side one? Uh, no, it it might have been like, or it could have been um, <laughs> cheats maybe. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now that's gonna bug me. Now I'm gonna have to figure <laughs> out what. But uh. And, and, yeah, it might have been cheat. I don't know, but it it was just somewhere I was like, okay, you, you know, it, 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 most most it's most rock guitar solos are pentatonic. It's funny yeah. I, I, you're kind of talking on this topic because I I I see this stuff like ads on on YouTube all the time where it's yeah. people like saying they can they'll teach you how to play guitar in thirty seconds and uh, <laughs> and uh, they always try to they always try to illustrate how guitar players going up and down the pentatonic scale is isn't musical and um and then it's like everyone it seems like everyone today like wants to skip you know like 
right to the Dorian scale or something. Right. But the way they illustrate the pentatonic scale, you know, it makes it seem more unmusical than it is. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. They really doll it up. <laughs> like, like you can get a lot of mileage out of it. Obviously. I, I mean, I like 98% of rock guitar solos are that, you know, right. Are, <laughs> if you would take, if you, if you somehow graph Jimi Hendrix's scale choices, like 95% would probably be the pentatonic, but there's nothing right. wrong with that. You know, it doesn't matter. Right. You don't need to reinvent words to make a great quote, you know? <laughs> right. Um, yeah. And he played, I mean, and he's probably one of the, you know, part of the 5% that plays other Mo, at least modes or you know other yeah. things besides the straight pentatonic scale but yeah um it ain't fixed you know, if it ain't broke <laughs> was it yeah definitely i mean and it's fine because like I, I don't know i think that that opens the door to be musical with those other scale choices like you're like oh i'm a lot of minor let me make this one work over a flat five or whatever like you get, it really starts to become like a training ground for how you take these boring, these boring things and be musical with it. Because like like you're saying, that five note thing, can't, as soon as you run through it, it doesn't sound like uh, paranoid. But if you do it the right way, it becomes paranoid, like Black Sabbath, you know? Um, right. But that, okay, so picking apart this and like, when did, like going through high school, were you playing in like uh, cover bands where you just like... Um, just jamming with friends is there a point like when that became like instead of just a learning tool like after figuring out this clash uh like lick and learning how to like express yourself with that when did you start writing your own songs i guess is what i'm trying to ask um yeah in, in high school um and i would I never was like in a proper like cover band or anything um but but yeah, like right, pretty much from the beginning, we were always kind of trying to make up our own songs. I think, um, and I, like I remember the first time, like using the four track and and uh, kind of writing, arranging it, the, the first song on that, you know, and yeah. playing all the parts, the bass, and the you know, um, that was kind of what got me into it was just kind of the um putting all the pieces together and being kind of um writing the bass line and writing you know coming up with two guitar parts and um that was always kind of what what inspired me i guess um yeah but um but yeah i don't know we you know it can in high school we, i was kind of i was kind of uh I don't know, for lack of a better word, kind of in the burnout crowd. And <laughs> it was just a lot of basement jamming and uh, um, just, you know, we kind of kept to ourselves, you know, musically. Got it. Well, yeah, that's where, that's where I don't know, that's where it all starts. It all starts yeah. in the basement and then works its yeah. way to the garage. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. But, um... <laughs> Uh, or to a practice space, proper practice space, you know. That's yeah, you know, that's the next level stuff. <laughs> right, right. Um but all right, so like you're writing your own tunes, you're kind of like how many how many uh, um bleeding heart tunes did you kind of like have before bleeding hearts? Were any of these like stuff you wrote like in high school that when when uh the when this opportunity came with Bob and like the that group came together, was there any like songs that you've been kind of holding on to because like like rags of riches man is such a well-written song how much of the material did i have before the bleeding hearts yeah um, that, that became bleeding hearts i guess yeah um it it kind of like most of it kind of turned over um there were a couple things that um carried carried through um right as rain was was uh was an was an early one um which was always funny you know it's like i suppose it's the same thing today but i mean a little bit less so like once you're kind of in part of a music scene and know like 
all who all the who everyone is like it's pretty easy to find you know the right people to play music with but yeah when you're like when you're like 17 18 and you don't know anybody like um my friend bob herbers and i would we would like you know like put ads in the city pages and and just you know meet random people through through like ads and it was it was just always like a really a real uphill battle to find you know people that were on sort of the same wavelength and and uh and i i worked i worked in uh restaurants and in the kitchen and stuff for like i don't know 10 years out of high school and um and so like you know i'd meet people through work and and it's just interesting how like a lot of people you would you would meet and play music with would just be like on opposite um ends of the spectrum you know musically you know and yeah uh, so like where i was going with this is like i remember i I recorded this song um right as rain with this guy um his name was rick and and uh i you know met him through these other guys i worked with and he was a keyboard player and he had a he had a I, okay studio in his basement um but he was like one of these keyboard players that would like he could play the whole song on piano like he didn't need a band you know and then you put him then you put him with a, a group of musicians and he's kind of still playing the whole song you know uh, like yeah yeah doesn't know when to hold back kind of over yeah yeah and, um <laughs> and, and as a side note it turns out this guy was like i think schizophrenic or something and and uh and I, I, I believe he like murdered somebody Holy years later. Shit. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but he, uh, <laughs> he, uh, um, he recorded, he recorded this version of of "Ride Is Rain" with me. And I just remember, I, I, I don't have it anymore, but I, I just remember it was like all keyboards. <laughs> it was just like compl- turned into a completely solo different, endeavor, <laughs> different song, and uh, and that was the one that um, you know when 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 I showed that one to Bob and uh, Bob's sensibilities like really uh, kind of honed honed that one in. Um, the right direction for sure definitely yeah it's interesting like when you don't when you don't know where the scene is and like you're just using your the outlets you have and even like now even now with like the internet and you're throwing out like a need a bass player for black sabbath cover band whatever like it's still i feel like is equally as like a a crapshoot of what you're gonna get i've done so many weird uh craigslist ad gigs where i you you meet the guy, you run the songs, you get to the gig, and then he's there in a wig. You're like, oh shit, <laughs> what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> and now you have an accent. Okay, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, like it never, it never changes, huh? No, I think, I th- but eventually, eventually, I think you do it long enough where you're like, okay, you meet the people in bands, and that that network becomes there, like becomes clear, or like well, you, you know, um. But okay, so that that was one that was hanging around. When you yeah, cause... I'm trying to think. There, there was uh, another funny thing was, uh, and I wish, oh god, I I really wish we had a copy of this. But um, Bob Herbers and I, um, we also like we started playing with this um, another keyboard guy, oh, no. <laughs> um, and, and he was he was he had really you know different. Um, it, you know musical taste like he was he had like a, a yamaha dx7 synthesizer um and he was into you know more avant-garde groups you know and anyway we but we ended up collaborating going to the studio and recording like this three or four song demo which um it, it actually turned out really cool but yeah. it was like it was like probably the most 80s sounding thing you could imagine you know like had, <laughs> had sizes on we did a we did a backwards guitar solo we did um it was like kind of pop you know and yeah. i mean i would kill to, to have a copy of it i don't know how it like 
how those things disappeared. I think we, I think we recorded over the master tape like <laughs> the next time we went into the studio, so we so we don't have the master or any copies of it. But um, so yeah, so so we did a couple of weird one-off things like that um, before um, you know we could kind of get a. A, a proper rock and roll group together, which, which is what we wanted all along. And I remember when the bleeding heart, when we kind of first started the bleeding hearts, I I had just gotten a, a Telecaster, and um, I remember just like thinking, wow, this is like this this unlocks the whole like Keith Richards sound. Right. Like it, 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 I mean, for I don't know, it, it's weird. I have Tellys now, and it's like I plug them in, and it doesn't even like sound like that different to me but like the first time like playing like a telly really loud through like a fender twin it was just like you know so troubly and so you know the chords just cut through like um so i remember that kind of was inspiring and 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 you know <clears throat> got us even kind of more on like a, a stones stonesy bent i guess you know Right. Well, once you kind of can reproduce a little bit of that tone, you're like, "Oh man, this is this is so close." And the, I don't know when you when you grow up, kind of like musically grow up, like kind of enamored and trying to figure out because like you, even the the Clash, Joe Strummer was rocking a telly. Like so much of a telly is, is a rock and roll sound, but it's like it it I don't know. It's it that's a really particular because it is it is a cut through thing. But like so when you when you can finally emulate some of those tones. And it's mm-hmm. you doing it, you know that that's like an that's like taking the scale notes and making a phrase with it in a way. It's just like a different phase of that phrase, and like I, I know because that's like I remember plugging into a Marshall the first time, being like, "Whoa, this is <laughs> this is like because I, I kind of relate to that that um, looking through that Stones like uh, uh, some girls and trying to figure out the liner notes. For me, it was ACDC's like um, uh, TNT." And like they're all, they had like detention slips or some shit, and you're like, whoa, they really got in trouble, you know. <laughs> um, but um, so you were working at this restaurant, and that's where you met Bob, right? Vincent? Uh, no, actually, um, I met him. I did, I met him at the Uptown Bar. So I think, I think when I was, I don't know, like twenty or so, I moved. I moved uptown and and I was like kind of down the street from from uh, the uptown bar. So I mean, I in fact I I probably was just turning twenty one and uh, and so that was that was the drinking age at the time. So I I, I kind of became a overnight regular at the at the uptown bar and and Bob's uh, mother worked there uh, as a bartender in the daytime. So um, I started you know seeing running into Bob pretty often. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I think around that time, um, we had a guitar player, um, you know, like the band had kind of, had kind of, uh, solidified, um, you know, two guitars, bass and drums. And, uh, we had just played a gig at the 400 bar and the next day the guitar player called me and said his car had, caught on fire on the way home <laughs> and his um his amp and guitar were destroyed and and he so i guess he had to quit the band and i was just like i thought he was just like this was just like some you know, bit yeah that <laughs> sounds made up <laughs> bullshit excuse yeah. he wanted to quit for some reason but uh, apparently it actually did happen so um we suddenly needed another guitar player and it just kind of suddenly you know occurred to me it's like I should just get Bob, you know, I think, um, I mean, clearly that by that point, um, the replacements were becoming more and more of an influence. I mean, um, I remember in high school, we were really into like REM and, uh, um, and then kind of started getting more into the replacements and stuff. So like <clears throat> they were definitely, um, becoming a, a bigger and bigger, you know, influence. And then, then it was like, well, I see Bob all the time. We should just get Bob to play guitar, you know? And um, so that's kind of what led to that. <laughs> nice. And well, it's crazy. It's one, it, 
I guess well, there had to be kind of like a persona around him if he's just around. Everyone's like, oh, it's Bob. Like, was there kind of like a kind of like a persona like that around him? Like people knowing who he was and like knowing what he did. And uh, or did he get you think he got asked all the time to play in bands? Um, yes and no. I mean, um, he had been, he had been in the, um, this band called static taxi for a long, I, I, like around the time I first met him, he was, he was still playing with them. And I, like, I, um, in fact, yeah, it's kind of a weird how it overlapped. Like he, I think he and I were becoming friends, but he was still in static taxi and I don't think I'd even asked him to play in the bleeding hearts yet, but he got me into like, go, you know, see, see static taxi at, at the caboose one night. Um, and, uh, but other than that, it's like, I think he kind of had like, um, you know, somewhat of a, a reputation of being like, uh, I don't you know, you know, having, issues you know yeah, with yeah. substance abuse issues and and uh maybe not being um completely reliable um you know but i mean he was also he's also a character and uh you know pretty you know pretty approachable um so i mean a lot of people you know everyone would just kind of come up to him hey bob you know can i buy you a beer oh sure you know whatever you know so i mean he was a, uh, yeah, definitely a a, a, a likable character, you know, to see around at the Uptown Bar. <laughs> was it? Did the is the Uptown a uh, turkey sandwich still a filling meal? The Uptown Bar closed like about <laughs> ten years ago, and it became <laughs> it became an Apple store. Oh no! Uh, or actually, they tore down the space and yep. built uh, like you know one of those kind of all glass front, you know, facade Apple stores. And now, and now that Apple store has closed. So it's like, um, yeah, sadly, the, sadly, the, uh, yep. The uptown, <laughs> the uptown bar Turkey sandwich is no more, but, um, <laughs> what was it? Yeah. Well, it went from an, it went from a, a uptown, uptown to a genius bar, I guess. Like it still remained a bar apparently, but <laughs> Um, that's that, but yeah. Uh, so like, um, when you asked him to be in the band, right? Didn't he uh, initially recommend someone else? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's funny. I, I um, that that I, I've I've been quoted on this story now a few times. So it's like, oh no, <laughs> I can tell the whole story again. But I, yeah, um, it, you know, the I will just say though that the the guy he he. Inter- introduced us to Jamie Garner, um, and I don't know if you're from. Are you familiar with the band, um, the Leather, the Leatherwoods? A little bit, just from the research, but uh, oh. n- not their whole like discography or like multiple records, just to get a, a sense of it. But yeah, yeah, actually, um, Peter Jesperson released their record, um, I believe, on Medium Cool Records, or mm. I, I think, um, and I believe Paul Westerberg produced a couple of songs for him and i think he even like wrote like a bridge for one of their songs um but anyway i mean fan- fantastic band um tim o'regan the the drummer um went on to be longtime drummer and current drummer for the jayhawks um and uh he's done some solo stuff too but yeah um Awesome band. So, I mean, we, we did, we, Bob did introduce us to Jamie Garner, who was no longer in the Leatherwoods, but, um, who's, you know, was a great lead guitar player. And, and he kind of, he, he, he kind of, you know, taught me some cool stuff. Um, he had, a, you know, real good, like power pop kind of rock guitar, you know, I don't know, tasty stuff that he added to the band. Um, yeah. and, and so, and, and I, you know, so I think the band kind of evolved um, during his brief time with us. I think it was about nine months or so. And, uh, and Bob saw us during that time and then 
So when, um, you know, Bob heard he was moving, he's like, you know, he was kind of approaching me about joining the band and instead of kind of the other way around, you know? Hmm. Well, that's cool. Cause it shows that, you know, it shows it, that the two from someone who kind of had that status and had your guys's respect, you know, it shows that you've grown and like musically are doing it right. You know what I mean? Like, cause when you're, when you're doing the whole DIY thing and the only, the only person kind of like, you know, running the, the business in a way is you, the only like, yeah, I mean, like, what what are feats of success that aren't money? Well, you know, it's the respect of people whose art you admire, and like to have someone be like, oh, "Can I play with you now?" Especially someone that you initially wanted to. That's like that's a huge that's a huge like achievement. Um, so with that, uh, when Bob starts playing with you, eventually you guys move in together, right? Well. Or he moves in with yeah. you. <laughs> I, so I, I had this. I had this rather fairly spacious one bedroom, garden level apartment on on Lake Street, um, across the street from from Lake Calhoun. And um, it was funny, like when J- when Jamie started playing with us, he moved into my place, and he was he slept on the couch. <laughs> and then shortly after, I don't know if Bob knew that Jamie. I think Bob must have known Jamie was living with me, and then. And then, you know, you know, so Jamie moves out and I'm, I'm finally got the apartment to myself again. And then um, Bob come, comes over to like, you know, learn all the songs and, and we're playing guitars. And he's like, I should move in. And I'm like, oh, OK, <laughs> so like a week later, I'm I'm moving Bob out of his mom's basement. Um, and uh, he took over the same couch that Jamie had had. <laughs> so, what was it? <laughs> yeah, the roommate, the roommate and bandmate life is a that that can that's a sticky sitch. Um, but uh, yeah. so I, I imagine <laughs> imagine living with Bob, you uh you you probably forcefully uh became a uh, aware of like yes in the entire yes catalog. Uh yeah, I mean <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, no. I, I you know I don't remember like hearing like a lot of deep cuts or anything, but like, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember kind of walking through the door and, and, in in roundabout would be on and, and he'd pick up the guitar and like play along, you know, note for note. Um, but you know, besides, besides, yes. I mean, I remember him playing like a lot more like Johnny winter and mm. records like that. He was, he was, uh, he was a big Johnny winter. Fan. He was, he, his guitar heroes were like Steve Howe, Johnny Winter. Um, he actually liked he actually liked Leonard Skinner. Um, I, I think he kind of like thought of him. I mean, I think I guess he was born in Florida, so I think he always kind of proudly, you know, proclaimed himself to be a Florida boy, um, like Leonard Skinner. So. Um, he was, he was, he was, uh, definitely into those guys. Um, who else? God. I mean, he would, he would play like Peter Jesperson would still kind of like, would make him like mix tapes and, you know, like give him like a big star tape. And, and so like, he actually was like kind of the one that turned me on to big star. Um, and uh and he was he was really into urge overkill at the time um that was kind of how i first heard urge overkill um so yeah nice it's it's interesting like when you leonard it kind of makes sense with like how his guitar kind of fits into like into um into bleeding hearts and even into like the replacements there's like this kind of like leonard skinnard's an interesting example because it has all those blues like tendencies and like chops and like kind of uh cool bits of that but it's layered in a way that makes it much more kind of a pop sensibility you know like it um like the lines really fit in and are harmonized and are this kind of wall of sound and like i feel like especially with this record like when Bob plays that, that brings that weird placement in a song, like that, like a Leonard Skinner guitar line between verses would do in a way. 
Hmm. Yeah, I mean, well, I get maybe part of it too is that we were both playing lead guitar, so um, that was definitely a element of of uh, Leonard Skinner was, you know, what yeah. they had like three or four lead guitars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but and that was what he liked with uh, he 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 really liked that um, Johnny Winter. Um, what is what is it live or Johnny Winter and. Mm. You know, when yeah. it's with Johnny Winter and Rick Derringer together, um, that's the stuff that Bob really liked. You know, he's um, so yeah. When when you've got two two hot lead guitar players playing together, and, and instead of just instead of just lead rhythm, and that and that that is actually the dynamic that was in the replacements as well, because um, because both right. Paul and Bob because both Bob and Bob played the guitar. Um, in fact, that's kind of the funny, one of the funny things about, um, I remember one time uh, we were playing a show and <clears throat> this uh, young young woman hands Bob a note after the show. And, uh, and, and <laughs> I think she was trying to be like, kind of, I don't know, like, ro- you know, romantic or something. She's like, the last 14 seconds of, of, uh, of, uh, 16 blue or however many seconds that the so the solo at the end of um 16 blue you know yeah and and bob bob shows it the note and then he's like it's paul <laughs> <laughs> so, so he would get he would get compliments all the time for for guitar solos that paul played uh, another <laughs> another funny one was um there were there was a they were the repl- he told me the replacements were like on the road and they're they're reading some review and some magazine or something and they and it was a really bad review like um and it and it singled out Bob and it said something like the guitar player um can't play or I don't know some yeah. something critical of Bob and 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 Paul was kind of um ribbing him about it and and Bob said do your you know you they're your guitar solos. Like, I think, cause I think <laughs> a lot of songs, Bob, you know, Paul would, um, have something in mind and, and give Bob a, a solo to play note for note. Uh. <clears throat> so kind of turn it around on him. <laughs> was it? But yeah, yeah, that's like, so as you were like, as a unit, right? Bleeding hearts is rolling. When you guys recorded what you're putting out now, like mm-hmm. what looking but was it is it being put out just as it was because these recordings are like amazing like the quality of everything and the tightness of the band everything is like locked in and the beat like what 21 recording these 22 i'm like holy shit mm-hmm. like you guys definitely yeah. put time into it so how did the i guess uh the process of putting this record out now um, yeah, it is pretty much coming out exactly the way it was. Like it was, it was mixed and mastered, you know, completely finished in like what, 94 or 90, I think, I believe, um, it's Doug Wild mastered it for us. I think it was, it might've even been 95 when we had it mastered. Um, and, uh, so, I mean, it was, it was complete then, um, but then when when we started talking with Bar None about putting it out now, that um, so I, in fact it was burned. It was bur- a master CD was made, so like we had a master that was going to be used to to press the CDs, um, and and so I've always had that master. It's been like my um, you know one copy of the record that I've listened to like all these years. Um, and there's always been like a few things that, that, um, you know, sort of stuck in my craw, you know, like we, I know that when we mixed it, um, Tommy Roberts and I like mixed, pretty much mixed the whole record in one night, you know, it was like, um, which is never really (laughs) ideal. Um, I mean, all the, you know, the settings like pretty much carried over from one, one song to the next, but but still, I mean, we kind of we kind of cranked it out um, in one marathon setting session. So, um, so yeah, we we transferred one of the tapes um, 
to digital and then and remixed a few things and then re, and then remastered the whole record but um but to answer your question yeah it's pretty much the way it you know was um you know then uh but and i can tell i can tell you you know why is we were when this was back when i i think we practiced like at least twice a week um like which i don't know by today's standards seems like a lot um like we we did get really really super tight and uh um, the first session we did in March of 93, I think we, I think we recorded like eight songs and, um, out of those eight songs, I believe, um, almost all of them are like live, you know, two guitars, bass and drums. Like, the, um, there's like one or two guitar overdubs that are like Bob overdubbed, I think one solo on, on from that first session. So like that, you know, and it was just, um, it just kind of sounded great right out of the box. You know, we didn't have to, we didn't really have to do anything to it, just overdub vocals. And, and, and it was pretty much as you hear it today, it was like, um, <clears throat> record, you know, recorded really well on, I think it was 24 inch or 24 track, one inch tape, I believe. Um, and uh, just, you know, has it has a great, you know, classic um, analog tape studio sound, I guess. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a tight sounding record. That's why I was like, did they go back and tighten some stuff up? Like, like, but that's amazing that it's just it's an incredible record it's really it's one i imagine you have to be really kind of excited to be able to put it out now because you've held on to it for so long and it's i'm sure it's old news you know for you but like it has to be kind of like exciting to be able to share it yeah oh yeah definitely i mean um you know i think i think um it, it once i think um once it kind of got on on more people's radar that you know i think i think Bob Mayer alluded to it and, and trouble boys, you know, talked about the bleeding hearts a little bit. And, um, you know, so I think people started kind of asking him, you know, when's that record going to come out? So I think once it kind of was on people's radar, um, it kind of got, it became inevitable that it would be released. Um, so yeah, it's definitely great to get it out there and get, and finally, um, We'll see, you know, it's still not out there yet. <laughs> it's it's going to be out there in, in, a, in a couple of weeks, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exciting, man. I don't know, like, and, and I imagine for a lot of uh, fans of The Replacements and to be able to hear this side of Bob and just for you to be able to put it out and be done with it, because I'm sure I've heard some interviews where people are asking you about that. And so to be able to share it and say, this is, this is it, here it is, you know, that's awesome. Um... Do you, uh, what, what kind of projects do you have going on now for your, what you're doing? Uh, well, you know, it, it's during the last couple of years. Right. With, uh, right. <laughs> uh, like the last like several, I don't know, six months or so that we've, once we kind of knew that the, the record was going to come out, um, me and Pat McKenna and, and Rob Rebello, the Bleeding Hearts bass player, um, we've been we've been playing, to, you know, kind of dusting off the cobwebs. Um, and uh, so yeah, we're we're gonna play. We're gonna do a show on Record Store Day. Nice. Um, and we we got John Freeman um, from the Magnolias to fill in again on rhythm guitar. So. Um, so yeah, we've been doing that. Uh, the Magnolias are are um, in the kind of early stages of trying to get plan another um, tour in Spain. So hope, hoping that'll happen um, on the back half of this year or next. We'll see how that kind of goes. Um, yeah, and then just kind of uh, getting the home studio going more, I guess in the yeah. last year or two. So, um, been recording some 
stuff for uh, different projects. Um, so yeah, Very it's cool. kind of yeah. Like uh, what? Where's what? As far as like what other projects? What's one that is near and dear that you're like? I, I guess uh, are you sitting in multiple bands, kind of producing stuff, or this is just like you writing stuff for different groups? Um. Well, like right now, um, I started. I, a couple of my, like back in January, I started working with with this group called Lowry Bridge, and uh, um, and uh, it's kind of <laughs> that's kind of evolving in an interesting way because I'm yeah I'm actually, I was they wanted me to play lead guitar on it on on this record, and um, I started recording. Um, I, what started out as kind of like demoing the songs. Um, it kind of became little little uh, mini productions, and I'm like, you know, maybe you guys shouldn't go in the studio. Maybe I should just record <laughs> record the song. And I and I don't know this the song the the style of this of these songs is kind of um, such that it kind of made me think, ah, this this could use like I should get like an Optigon or a um, Mellotron. I, so I got like I I've been getting into like. MIDI keyboards and um, different. I've got like all of these, um, you know, keyboard banks now that I can choose from. Um, and I've been doing like Chamberlain and Mellotron and all this, all this stuff. Um, and it's been pretty fun, you know, actually <laughs> to experiment with all these sounds on, on, on this uh, other, this unsuspecting other band songs. <laughs> <laughs> turning them into uh, yeah but that's, it's yeah that's awesome like there's that i don't know like i feel like once you get the music bug especially for guitar players and you're like oh i can figure out how to express myself through a guitar and you pick up a ukulele and you're like oh shit it's the same thing i just push down the strings and now i can do like it's it's there but i just gotta rethink some things like eventually that yeah. evol evolves down to like taking like mog sense and making some red like i don't know it it unlocks that 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 this can say a thing now too and that's really like the digital world the midi world of stuff is like because that's something i've been kind of diving into a little bit with like with teaching and like it it get, you it's endless you know mm -hmm. yeah yeah i i mean um i when when in the in the past like I, I I can remember like the like very first experience in the studio. Um, I think we I think we tried playing to a click track one of the first times we went in the studio. But for the most part, you know, it's like um, we've tried to like stay away from using click tracks. Right. Uh, and uh, which is you know is it it is nice if you're playing with a band and 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 you know, your drummers got a pretty, you know, decent meter. Um, if you don't have to have that click in your ear. Um, but anyway, I guess now I'm, now I'm like, now I, I just recently, um, I started using that easy drummer. Mm. Uh, yeah. And, 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 and now it's like when I'm in pro tools, I'm using, the, I'm on a grid instead of, uh, whatever the other thing is called, you know? So like, it's just kind of working in MIDI on a grid. So like you can play something and then you can just try to, you know, you can just move it around and like you can, you know, it's just, it's just weird how like everything you can just swap anything out. You can, um, you can change the drum parts after, you know, right. After the songs done, you know, you can kind of go back and rewrite a drum part and, and it just, goes right over you know it's like you don't have to you don't have to worry about line you know syncing things up it's just like everything's always synced all the time it's, right it's right. bizarre it is it is it's it's amazing and you're like fuck all the hours we did those you know what i mean like yeah um, right well and it's funny because like we the midi exist you know obviously existed um 30 40 years ago um like it was around when I first started playing it, but it was always so alien to me, you know, that, um, and even, even a couple of years ago, like I would see it, you know, and I would see someone, you know, like the first time I saw someone like on YouTube, you know, saying, 
here's how you edit a MIDI track in Pro Tool. You know, they showed, you know, the MIDI, uh, you know, on a track, and and I'm and I'm just like thinking, you know, like they're gonna actually edit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just see, it's so computer techy, you know. Yeah. Uh, but it it actually once you once you start kind of doing it, it's actually shockingly, um, uh, you know, easy. I guess. Right. No, I, I agree. Yeah. I think you have to have a, a sensibility, a music sensibility of how to like um, correctly utilize it. You know what I mean? Like, oh wait, this is a triplet feel. I need to make sure I I uh, quantize it to the that triplet feel or whatever. So you you got to. Yeah, I know how the grid works, which is musically like planned and thought out. But I agree. Right. Like once you get the hang of it, you're like, oh, I'm a drummer. <laughs> like, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But that's cool, man. Um, I guess to kind of wrap wrap up our chat here, which one? Thank you so much for taking some time out to talk with me. I super appreciate it. Um, what was like one lesson from? Because I know your your relationship with Bob was pretty manic at times and and then also not but what was one like maybe lesson that stuck with you today from your time with bob ah uh, i think <laughs> he he was you know he he had that he had that kind of uh big brother um teacher side to him you know that yeah. uh you know, you could tell, you could kind of, in some ways, like I kind of became this project for him at the beginning. And he, and he would like, he would like tell me like, you know, this is, not, this, you got to sing from your gut. You know, he would kind of, you know, basic things like, you know, telling you how you're supposed to sing. He would, he, but he would, he had a really over like arching sensibility about just how, songs were put together like some like on riches to rags for instance um shortly after i kind of came up with that uh, idea for the guitar part and stuff it was bob who like jumped in on bass on that one and said this, this is how the bass should go you know and um which is funny because it's it kind of i think the bass line to that song kind of you know makes it sound even more like the replacements, <laughs> um, you know, but that was all Bob, you know, it kind of like, they should go like this. And, and, uh, so yeah, he came up, he wrote the baseline of all things. And he would, he would like, he would get behind the drums and, and show Pat like really specific things, you know, like, um, at the end of the song tonight, uh, there's this little kind of, the very last bar of tonight where the, what the drums do, Bob, for some reason thought of that and like showed Bob Pat how to play it. And, and it was just like, seemed so random and like such a, uh, you know, specific detail, but you know, with, we, we would end up using all, you know, all of these things would get woven into the, into the final song, you know? Um, he did that. Uh, he did that. He, he had like another idea like that on uh, "Right as Rain." Like the he <laughs> he it was like the song. The chorus is "Right as Right as Rain," and he said at the end, "It's you got you got to say Ooh Rise.'" He wanted me to say "Ooh Rise," and I was like, <laughs> "Why? <laughs> Why?" <laughs> it's like really random, but in that that we ended up using that too. It was funny. It was like. Um, so yeah, he had like these, he had a lot of like great ideas that were, you know, like, um, it kind of seemed random, but you know, he would just kind of get an idea in his head and, um, and, uh, you know, if Bob shows you something like that, your, your chances are, you're going to use it, you know? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is, <laughs> but those little things like that, you know, like they, they stick out and they make the song like. I don't know, like when you hear a Don't Fear the Reaper, you hear the cowbell, the arguably least, you know, important part of that song. But um, right. so is the kind of, that, that's it? Like, you, you, do you find yourself doing that now? It's like honing in the more small details that most people are like, wait, what, what's that matter? And you're like, no, this is it. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, well, you know, like I've I've always in, in kind of enjoyed um, arranging and you know, kind of adding that kind of stuff too. But yeah, I mean, I don't know if I got that from Bob. Um, I mean, to to a degree, though. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I guess it's just you know when you hear when you hear someone's when you hear a song you know ideas like that pop into your head and you just kind of you got to run with them i guess even if they don't even if they don't make sense on paper i guess you know <laughs> right right well and most of them don't <laughs> right it's a yeah it's, why they? yeah 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 there's so many different levels to it especially like listening and like recording in a way and when you're developing like a whole linear thing of a project you know um, but Mike, thank you so much for, uh, taking some time to chat with me, man. I've really dove getting the, I really enjoyed getting the dive into this, uh, this like sneak peek of this album and like, uh, getting to like pick your mind about it. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. My pleasure. Um, uh, yeah. Look forward to seeing the article. <laughs>